really a cheery day outside, isn't it? Despite the temperature, it's uh, glad that we might have a hint of spring coming, so that's really, really good. We weren't sure what would happen a couple days ago when we were expecting the ice and the six inches of snow, but uh, Indy had this little band that missed us all, so we're very grateful for that, that we can gather as God's family. So it's good to see all of you, and uh, glad that we can be here today. How many of you have a watch? I expected, yeah, almost everybody put their hand up. I have a, one that's powered by solar. During the week, I wear an exercise band, but on the Sabbath, I take a rest. I wear my solar-powered watch instead, so it gets a rest. But uh, we check our watches pretty frequently because time is important, isn't it? We have life is based on time. So we have appointments. Maybe you had a doctor's appointment this week, or maybe you had another thing you had to be uh, located there on a specific time. Our meals are based on time. We have noon, right? Noon time uh, meal. Dinner is a little more flexible, maybe. You might flux between, say, 6 and maybe 7.30, something like that. Be a little flexible with dinner time. And so we check our watches throughout the day to make sure that we arrive on time, right? We want to be at services on time so we can hear what's going to be said. But there's a very important thing that is based on time, and that's God's plan. God's plan is based on time. We have the weekly Sabbath day. Pictures, six days for man, one day for God. If we expand that out, we have 6,000 years for man and 1,000 years picture in the millennium. So each week, we get to celebrate what God has planned for time. What would happen if you arrived late on your job, periodically, you're supposed to start at, say, 8. But four out of the five days of the week, you show up, oh, maybe about 10. <laughs> you had to get your cup of coffee, stop by and get your, maybe your bagel. Would your boss be pleased? Mine wouldn't. And my boss is in Houston. He'd never know if I'm late. But he wouldn't appreciate it because things would begin to back up. Well, how would you feel if God didn't do something on time? How would that make you feel? If you were expecting him to do something? Well, we'd probably begin to doubt, wouldn't we? And we'd probably lose faith because God didn't perform something we were expecting. Well, there's one event in history that occurred exactly on time, and we can totally rely upon it. In fact, Les and I were talking a little bit yesterday. We didn't think our messages would coincide. Actually, they do, because God is guiding all that takes place, and he's guided history, and his plan is going forward exactly on time. What's the one event I'm talking about? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. It happened exactly on time. I'm supposed to be clicking. Do we have my? Yeah. So the question I want to answer today is, did God keep his word? Did Christ keep his word? And the title is, as easy as one, two, three. Pretty simple, right? We're going to go through some of those things. I have a PowerPoint so we can see some of the layout. You know, when Jesus lived on the earth, he did a lot of things that really proved that he was God in the flesh. I'm not going to read it, but you can reference Acts chapter 2 and verse 22. It talks about the miracles that he performed, the wonders and the signs that he did. And yet, the scribes and the Pharisees doubted all of it. They wanted a sign. They asked Jesus Christ, show us a sign. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Christ gets a little angry with them. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. He called them an evil and adulterous generation. He was ticked, I guess is a polite way to say that. <laughs> Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38. Christ gives us the one sign. Matthew 12, verse 38, some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
They didn't believe the miracles. They didn't believe the healings that had taken place, all the things that Christ had done. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given except to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. We're not going to turn to Jonah, but Christ explains it here in verse 40. He says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Seventy-two hours. We think about how God designed the days. Twelve hours is daytime. Twelve hours is nighttime, generally. Obviously, based on circumstances, it might vary a little bit. But overall, it's equal. Twelve and twelve. So you add three days together, you get 72 hours. If God didn't fulfill this sign, what happens? Whoops. I'm ahead of myself. How's that out of order? Oh, yeah. Christ isn't the Messiah. Let that sink in for a minute. If this sign isn't fulfilled, we don't have a Messiah. There's no hope beyond this physical life. But that's not all. We don't have forgiveness of sin. That's big. And last, lastly, we can't trust God. If what Christ said in Matthew 12 is not true, if he didn't fulfill this sign, we have no hope. In fact, the early church even battled this thought. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 13. The time of Paul... They were struggling with this same thing as well. This is the resurrection chapter, as we know it to be. And in verse 13, Paul says, If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So the question would be then, why are we here? Why do we keep the Sabbath? Why do we look forward to the holy days and keep those days if this sign was not fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Verse 17. If Christ is not risen, again he repeats the thought, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. That's a pretty dark place to go if we don't have anything. And then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. I think that's becoming my favorite scripture. I really do. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Because it really captures the thought of God in the plan that he has outlined. Timing is important to God. And God can be trusted. So did Christ keep his word? Did he keep his word? Let's look at what Christianity teaches. I was astounded to find this statement. This comes from the CatholicAnswers.com. And uh, you can see it on the screen, but I'll read it for those who are at home. Maybe they... The ancient Jews counted as a whole day or a part of a day. So three days and three nights could be as little as 24 hours plus a few seconds on either side. Really? That's not how I read my watch. Is that how you read yours? 24 hours plus, man, give or take a little on either side. Well, what else do they have? Three pretty bold statements here as well. This comes from a CatholicAnswers.com. Now, again, this is the Catholic teaching. But really, when you expand it out to the other groups that are out there, the mindset is existing in all of them. What do we have? Three days and three nights. It's just a demonstrative way of saying three days. It doesn't literally mean 72 hours. Wow. If we took literally, that is Christ's statement, to mean three full days, it would mean Jesus would be dead for exactly 72 hours, something that nobody proposes. Again, if this sign isn't fulfilled, what are we left with? And last... 
We must therefore recognize that this expression is not to be taken fully literally. It involves a figurative expression. Again, if this didn't happen, if Christ didn't fulfill this, what are we left with in life? Not a whole lot. Let's look at the math. This is how it looks visually. I compliment my sons. I couldn't put this together. They did it for me. I give them a raise. They get to stay another night with us. <laughs> but they helped me quite, quite a bit, so I appreciate that, guys. But we can see it here. If Christ was buried Friday evening and he's resurrected Sunday morning, do the math. It's half the time he said he would be in the grave. And this is what is taught in our world. 36 hours, not 72. You have a day and a half. Now, there's a lot of explanations. I'm not going to go through that today. That's not the focus of my message, but there's, I understand that. There's a lot of explanations of how they compact you know, parts of days and all those kind of things. If you're interested, take the time to look it up. It's confusion. It's confusion. So who's correct? Who is correct? Is Jesus Christ correct? Or is what we hear in our world and that teaching correct? Let's go back to Paul. We're there in 1 Corinthians still. Let's go back to Paul. Let's just, this time, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Paul says, I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. Yeah. That Christ died for our sins. Okay. Truth number one. According to the scriptures. That's a pretty plain statement. Christ died according to the scriptures. There's a lot wrapped up in those two phrases. You can go back to Genesis 3. You can go back to the prophets, prophecies in Isaiah. Several Psalms fulfill those things. Verse 4. He was buried. He arose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we have this phrase, third day. Don't get bogged down on this phrase, third day. I want to go and look at a couple of principles as we think of that phrase. Because it doesn't exactly define what Christ said, right? It's a little bit different. Christ said three days and three nights. Here we just said third day. A couple principles to keep in mind. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10. 1 John 5 and verse 10. I'm trying to go through this logically rather than just here's our truth. We want to see the truth as it unfolds for us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10. This is a very uh, plain statement that we should always keep in mind. It says, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. So there has to be the element of belief. And we can couple that with Hebrews 11, right, the faith. But then it says, and there's a semicolon, so this is a separate statement. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. That's pretty powerful. God gave a testimony. And we have it in our lap. Maybe you have it on your phone. We, Esword on uh, Android just came out. I, it's fantastic. I love it. Now I can get it on my phone. The testimony that God sent is the truth. And this statement says either you believe it or God's a liar. Which camp are you going to be in? Which guide are we going to believe? Now, this is principle number one. Let's go back to Isaiah 55 and in verse 8. This is principle number two. So we begin to outline here the truth that God has recorded for us. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. You'll recognize it as soon as we read it. It says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So if we don't believe God, he's a liar. And God says, well, I think different. I'm glad he does. I'm glad God thinks differently because, you know what, my brain needs a lobotomy. And it could happen right now, and I'd be totally thrilled. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't be, but I would be. There's a lot of junk up there, and it's probably the same for you. 
Two principles. God thinks different, and we have to believe him. So now, how does God count days? We're not going to turn there. I'll encourage you to do that separately on your own time. Genesis chapter 1. We have a pattern. The pattern is always evening followed by morning. Another way you might say that is darkness followed by light. The pattern is the same as God created. It's all through there, Genesis chapter 1. And then we link this with John 11 and verse 9. We're not going to read that one either. There's 12 hours in a day. So when God designed the time elements, the lights, the sun, the stars, all those things, he designed them perfect. Equality. 12 hours of darkness followed by 12 hours of daytime. And that's how God counts days. It's backwards to how we count time. Because man has shifted it to count from midnight to midnight. Almost can't get any further apart than what God designed. To go from the middle of the nighttime to the middle of the nighttime. God designed it to go from sunset to sunset. We're really interested in sunset on one day. <laughs> right? Atonement. We follow sunset pretty closely on that day. <laughs> but that's how God established it. Sunset to sunset. Now, as you begin to study in preparation for the upcoming spring holy days, you're going to see a lot of different phrases. In fact, let me pull out another slide here. I missed that one. Very important. Equal times, right? Equal times, evening, and daytime. As you study the scriptures, you're going to see other expressions. In three days. Okay? We're not going to go through these verses where you can jot them down. You're going to see after three days. And then you're also going to see within three days. Paul made the statement the third day. Don't get hung up on those. A lot, in most cases, the, the, the writers are simply condensing to a shortened form of what Christ stated. He said three days and three nights. So let's not get hung up on these. Pe people will do. They, they get stuck on that. But they're really, in a, a lot of ways, it proves the timeline. Right? Remember how God counts time. Evening and daytime. So if the phrase is three days, or after the third day, or within three days, what have we proven? That the time span has elapsed, have we not? The time has taken place. Because that's how God counts time. So if the third day occurs, it's been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled. So who is correct? Let's go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. Who is correct? Is it Christianity? Or is what God has outlined as the testimony that he left for us in the life of his son, Jesus Christ? Romans chapter 3, verse 4. I want to extract one statement here. It says, Let God be true and every man a liar. That's the truth. God is correct. God is correct. Jesus Christ kept his word. There's only one timeline in scripture that works. Sign of Jonah. In three days. Right? After three days. Within three days. And the third day. Oh, but there's one more. And who said that one? Jesus Christ. And there's only one timeline that works, and that's this. A resurrection on Sabbath just before sunset. It's completely opposite of what is taught today. This is a truth that God has given to his church to help us understand God's timeline and what he's working out. So all the statements that we read and I extracted from the websites that say it's all figurative is wrong. Absolutely wrong. 
absolutely wrong. So what then does Scripture teach about the correct timing of Christ's death and resurrection? Well, let's recap what we've learned so far. Christ told us he'd be in the grave for three days and three nights, right? There's 72 hours. God counts days, how? Evening and morning. That's how God counts days. And the Friday crucifixion, the Sunday resurrection, cannot be three days and three nights. It's impossible. You can't, no matter how you squash time, you can't put it into that time period. You can't do that. Let's go to John chapter 20. We're going to begin to construct the truth that God shows us, the testimony that he leaves us, that Christ kept his word. John chapter 20, verse 1. I'm going to pull this out here. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And I know we'll be reading through these stories as we begin to make preparation and get our mining gear for the Days of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. What, what are we told here? It's early, and it's still dark. Now, let's relate that to what we've just learned. If God counts time, evening, and then morning, that makes this when? The fourth day. Right? Because based on this statement and how God counts time, Christ couldn't have been resurrected on the first day of the week. It had to have been before that day started which has to have been at sunset, just before sunset on the Sabbath, right? Based on how God counts time. Let's go back to Leviticus 23 and verse 32. I kind of alluded to this earlier. This is a scripture we hold dearly on the Day of Atonement, but it again reinforces how God counts time. Leviticus 23 and verse 32 it says here, it shall be, this is about the Day of Atonement. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls, which means fasting, on the ninth day of the month at evening, when the day starts. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. So Christ had to have been resurrected just before sunset on the Sabbath. That's the only way the timeline works. So this becomes our starting point of counting. We start just before sunset on the weekly Sabbath. I can't break dance very well, but those guys can go backwards, right? So if we count backwards, three days and three nights, let's do that. Saturday to Friday, Friday to Thursday, Thursday to Wednesday, right? So Wednesday evening, just before sunset, is when Christ was buried in the tomb. So let's go through the timeline of Christ's crucifixion. Christ ate the Passover and instituted the new covenant symbols. After sunset, on Tuesday evening, right, which is what? the night portion of Wednesday, right? This is where man gets really confused, and you gotta keep it straight up here, or you're gonna get off, right? I like to use the phrase, the night portion of Passover, because Christ kept the Passover, and now we're going through that time span of Passover, the period, right? So we have the evening portion. He's betrayed by Judas. He's arrested and brought before the high priest. When? Anybody want to answer? During the night. During the night. Right? The nighttime portion of Passover. Right? Then he's brought before Pilate in the morning. 
right, in the morning. I do want to look at some scriptures here. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 27 and in verse 1. We're going through the chronology. It's important that we understand this. A basic truth. It's a fundamental doctrine for us, understanding the timing of all these things. Matthew chapter 27 and in verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. This is about 6 a.m. About 6 a.m. this took place. You can also reference Mark chapter 15. Then Jesus is crucified at about 9 a.m. Let's go back to Mark chapter 15 and verse 25. Mark chapter 15 and verse 25. There's a lot of details, but they're scattered throughout the various gospel uh, passages. Mark chapter 15 and verse 25, we're told here, it was the third hour and they crucified him. So this would have been about 9 a.m. Now, hold your place here and let's go over to John 19 and verse 14. Because there's a potential conflict that occurs. And we'll explain that here momentarily. John 19 and verse 14, John makes a slightly different statement. John says it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. Whereas the scripture in Mark said it was the third hour. Did God get it wrong? No. No. Let me share some comments regarding these two scriptures. Notice Mark 15 uses the third hour and Mark, John 19 uses the sixth hour. What's going on? Remember the Jewish method of timekeeping. 12 hours of daylight. And that starts from sunrise, right? So 6 a.m. would have been sunrise. Mark said it was the third hour. Where's that put us? 9 a.m., right? When John is recording his gospel, which took place about 30 years later, roughly, he's writing from the area of Ephesus. And his audience would have primarily been Gentile. So John uses the Roman time counting. Much different, right? Completely different. The Roman method, which we use today, the sixth hour corresponds to 6 a.m. Okay, it still looks like we got a little bit of a problem, right? John's account includes the trial. The trial started at 6, goes to about 9, and then Christ is crucified. So don't get hung up on the two variations. The idea is that John included several of the details of the trial. That's why, and also he uses the Roman method of counting time. John chose to include the official hearings, which would have began at 6 a.m., leading to Pilate turning him over to be crucified at 9. That's why there's the difference. There's, we keep that in mind. Now let's go back to our story flow. So Christ is brought before Pilate in the morning. He's crucified about nine. We have darkness, right, from noon to about three. And then Christ dies at about 3 p.m. Let's go back to Matthew 27, verse 45. We're walking through these things so that we can see the account that God has left us. So we understand the truth. Matthew 27, verse 45. From the sixth hour, which would have been noon, again, they're using the Jewish method of counting time, sunrise starting at 6 a.m., the sixth hour puts us at noon, until the ninth hour there was darkness over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He becomes sin for us at this particular point. Those who stood there, when they heard it, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He dies. We've gone through in other messages that uh, he was pierced. Or, yeah, he was pierced. And John records that in his gospel account. Jesus dies. Now let's turn over to Luke chapter 23, verse 54. Christ's body is placed in the tomb just before sunset. Luke chapter 23. Verse 54. Luke chapter 23, verse 54. This is an important nugget to pull out as well. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. Verse 53, they, they took it down, that is his body. They wrapped it in linen, laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock, where no one had ever lane before, and that day was the preparation that the Sabbath drew near. So this was the Sabbath that's being referred to here is what? High Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. That's the Sabbath that's being referred to here. So let's look at a diagram. Here's what we have. And this is how it actually takes place, what we read about in Scripture. Christ is buried. Wednesday evening, we have the 24 hours of Thursday that take place, right? Darkness followed by light. Then we have the darkness followed by light for Friday. And then we have the darkness followed by light for Sabbath. It adds up as easy as one, two, and three, right? Three days and three nights. As the master guide planned it, as Jesus Christ said it would happen, it happened. And he's resurrected just before sunset on the Sabbath so that he can fill another scripture that he said and that he is Lord of the Sabbath, just as God had planned. So what do we see from this diagram? We have the first day Thursday, which we call today, is the high day. Let's go to John chapter 19 and verse 31. We're told that. This is the first day of unleavened bread. Christ kept the Passover at the beginning. The Jews kept the Passover when? At the end. They're slaughtering the Passover lambs as Jesus Christ, the lamb, is being killed. A little bit ironic. John chapter 19 and verse 31. We're told here. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might not, or they might be taken away. Now, a little further down, we've gone through that before. It's not chronologically because John inserts the note, actually let's go through that, verse 34, it reads in your Bible, one of the soldiers pierced his side. No, it should read, one of the soldiers had pierced. It's reflecting back on what had taken place because John is adding to the account later. And he's telling us why they didn't break his legs. Because they, he had been pierced. It's not chronological, okay? We tend to think when we read it's chronological. I do. But that's not the case here. So the first day is the day of unleavened bread. It's a high day. The second day is a Friday. So we have the high day. Then we have a Friday. It's a normal business day because, right, the Sabbath is over. It's the high day, the Sabbath. So the women go and buy spices on Friday. Right? You can reference, let's go over to Luke chapter 23. Verse 55. This is what scripture tells us. This is the account God has left. We have to look at what God has recorded. Luke chapter 23, verse 55. Or verse, excuse me, verse, yeah, verse 55. 
The women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So they took note as he's being buried because they're mentally preparing for they're going to come back and anoint his body. It says, then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Well, what do we see? Well, the first day we're counting is a high day. So they couldn't have bought spices that day. And the third day is also a Sabbath. So they can only buy spices in between on Friday. So that's why we have a little bit, uh, appears to be a confusing statement. They returned and prepared spices, and then they rested on the Sabbath. We have to understand the timeline of what's going on. Let's also look at um, Mark chapter 16 and verse 1. Mark chapter 16 and verse 1. We see here, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint them. The Sabbath being what? The high day. The high day. So then we have day three. As we see here is the weekly Sabbath. The disciples and the women rested. Jesus Christ is resurrected just before sundown. And we have what? One day, two days, and three days. Just as Christ said would happen, just as God had planned it, fulfilling all the prophecies that we read about and that we can understand is true. So why is a Friday crucifixion and a Sunday resurrection kept? by the rest of our world. I've often wondered that. Why do, we, why do they do that? Well, let's think about it. A Sunday resurrection is the main proof that Sunday is the appropriate day to worship. Why? Maybe Romans 8 has something to do with it. The carnal mind is enmity against God. If you can get as far away as we can get, I speak we mean mankind, from what God teaches, is the goal. Why is that? Tie in Revelation chapter 12. And Revelation chapter 13. Who is the power that is behind this age that we live in? It's Satan. Now God is directing things to be according to his plan. But the power that is influencing everything is Satan. He hates God's plan. And so he's trying to create confusion in how we keep time, how we see God's interface with man. Everything is confused. And so if he can sway mankind into thinking that the first day of the week is the appropriate day to worship, he's ahead of the game temporarily. And the reasoning is that if Christ was resurrected on a Sunday, well, then it has to be the right day. If that's the day that Christ was resurrected, well, sure, that's when we need to worship God. That's not what we've proven to be. The Sabbath is still the seventh day. It has been. Ever since creation. God hasn't changed that. Jesus Christ is still Lord of the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath. Why would he change that? God hasn't changed. God designed it perfectly. Let's see where I'm at. So the question is, why does it matter? Why does it matter if Christ fulfilled this? We've been through the timing. Why does all of this matter? Timing is important to God. Think back to the stories that we read about. The night to be much observed, which we'll keep in about seven weeks. We know that as the maledictory covenant. What does God say? 430 years to the very same day, he brings out the nation of Israel. Is timing important to God? Yes, it is. 
What does Christ say about his return? Only the Father knows. Has God got the exact moment picked? I don't have any doubt that he does. Would I like to know it? Oh, yeah. We all would, right? Timing is important to God. How about the 50th day? In relation to what? The Jubilee? Pentecost? God's very aware of time. It's extremely important to him. How about us in our life? Is God aware of what's going on? We have multiple prayer requests. We have them every week. Is God aware of what's going on in your life? Absolutely. Does he have the perfect timing arranged and planned? Yes, he does. Would we like to know the answers? Yes, we would. Will we know the answers? In time, we will. God's got it planned. He's perfect in his timing, in his arrangements. Timing's important to God. That's why we have the Sabbath day every seventh day. So we can count. And we can realize that his plan is going forward. What else? It proves that God can be trusted. If God didn't fulfill this sign, let's all go home. Why are we even here? Because there's no hope beyond this life. There's no hope past the physical time that we have. The three score and ten or whatever God gives you. If it's four score, maybe more. There's no point. Absolutely none. God, it proves that God can be trusted. What's that mean? Acts chapter 1. Christ goes up into the heavens, right? And he says that two angels, in the same fashion in which he arose, we count on that promise, don't we? He'll come back. Several times it's recorded, your sins are forgiven. We covered it a little, little while ago. The promises. If God can't be trusted... With this one thing, what hope do we have? This is a powerful sign. It, it's no wonder that Satan wants to confuse any understanding about it. Totally mix it up. Because he can confuse the importance of Christ's death and resurrection. Why would he want that? It's the central event to God's plan. If this doesn't happen... None of the holy days connect. None of them. Jesus Christ, as we know, is the central figure in all of the holy days. If he doesn't fulfill this sign, there's no point in the holy days. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Thankfully, Paul tells us in very encouraging words that God can be trusted. Timing is important. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. Let's go back there. We read it earlier. It says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Paul had something greater in mind when he wrote this, and that's why he continues in verse 20. He says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, and that goes all the way back to the choice that was made with Adam and Eve. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Christ came in the flesh. The timing that God arranged for Christ to come in the flesh was perfect. The establishment of the governments and the roads and the means for him to travel and to get the, or preach the gospel... God planned that. And so Christ came at the exact perfect timing that the gospel could be given. And he brought life through what we saw and, and how he offered his life. For, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And each one 
in his order. God has perfect timing. And so we wait, don't we? We wait for that timing to be worked out. We long for that timing to be fulfilled. What Jesus Christ said would happen, would happen. It did. Three days and three nights. It happened. Just as Christ said. We read it earlier. If we don't believe God, we make him a liar. I don't want to be found to be that person. Let's go to Romans 5 and verse 10. Bring this all to a close here. Romans 5 and verse 10. Satan wants to confuse the understanding of this wonderful truth. And God is allowing it at the moment. But eventually it will be known in a tremendous way. Romans 5 and verse 10. What are we told here? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. As before God called us, we were all enemies. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's the death of Jesus Christ that begins this process of the reconciliation, of the forgiveness of sin. But it's his resurrection and the life that makes the whole thing possible. And so in about seven weeks, we'll keep the Passover as the first step in God's plan, as our annual reminder that God's plan is going perfectly right on time.